In this lecture, we'll review sections 9.4 and, and the beginning of 9.5. Um, 9.4 on useful theorems and the correlators related to um, determining the existence of Hamiltonian paths and uh, some restrictive conditions for Hamiltonian cycles, and then we'll get into graph coloring in 9.5. So, um, so the section 9.4 is just a listing of, of uh, basically uh, a theorem for Hamiltonian paths and a theorem for Hamiltonian cycles with corollaries that can be useful in determining whether or not the graph could have the paths. Not doesn't say anything about how to find it. It's just is is the, is the existence um, of a path uh, uh, can we can we say whether one exists or not. So the path theorem states this, that if you had a loop-free graph and you have at least two vertices, the cardinality of the vertex set is n and it's greater equal to two, if the degree of any two vertices that you pick, x and y, is such that the sum of those two degrees uh, is greater than or equal to n minus one for all two, for any given pair of vertices x and y, where they're distinct, then the graph has to have a Hamiltonian path. But realize how restrictive that is, that the sum of the two degrees of any two vertices you choose has to be just one less than the total number of vertices. So there's got to be a lot of a lot of edges associated with any random two vertices. So it's many graphs, it's highly unlikely for that to happen, but you know, if that's the case, then probably, you know, we're pretty much assured that we're going to have a Hamiltonian path. Corollary to that is, again, assuming two vertices, if you had that the degree of every vertex was greater than or equal to n minus 1 over 2, that has to be true for every vertex, all right, then the graph would have a Hamiltonian path. Not showing how to find it, but at least you, 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 you will have one in the graph. Very restrictive. Both of those conditions are very restrictive. For Hamiltonian cycles in 1960, Orr proved that if you had a loop-free, undirected graph, then now you must have at least three vertices. And then you can show that the sum of the, uh, you pick two vertices that are non-adjacent, x and y that are non-adjacent in your vertex set, then the sum of their degrees has to be the number of vertices in or larger. What we mean by non-adjacent <clears throat> is this little graph here, looks at this little subgraph here, where you have x and y separated <coughs> by a vertex uh, z. In other words, there can't be an edge directly between x and y. They're non-adjacent. Right? But then again, look, what we're saying is that the degree of x and the degree of y, the sum of them has to be greater than or equal to n. Corollary. Um, using some other conditions here for a loop-free undirected graph, again, at least three vertices. Can you show that the degree of every vertex is greater than or equal to n divided by two? It has to be true for every one of your vertices. Then you, then you have a cycle. There is a Hamiltonian cycle somewhere in there. If the edge set is such that the cardinality of the edge set is greater than n minus one choose two plus two. Again, this could be a very large number there, plus two then G has a Hamiltonian cycle. So again, these are not necessarily very common conditions that are gonna happen. It's sort of an extreme case. The graph is you know, nearly well connected there. Then there's a good chance you would have a Hamiltonian cycle. Right? So these are just using tests that can be easily programmed. These checks can be easily programmed. Won't tell you how to find it, but at least you'll know one is there, whether it be a Hamiltonian path or cycle. So section 9.5 is the last section of this chapter uh, on graph theory, and it's on graph coloring. And we're going to motivate it by a very uh, useful problem that comes up, using graphs in a way of separating chemicals. So suppose you have this issue of the storage of chemical compounds in a warehouse, and suppose the compounds are acid and bases, and they can't be near each other. Certain chemicals just simply cannot be near each other. Leakage purposes could cause reactions, maybe explosions, really bad things that happen. So suppose you want to partition your warehouse in a way to separate these chemicals, right? And so the question of the design question is, well, then how many compartments do you need to accomplish that goal? So here's the model we're going to look at. Suppose you have 25 chemical compounds and they will be indexed C1 through C25. That's the vertex set. 
and we'll draw an edge in this undirected graph between vertex CI and CJ if those two chemicals have to be stored separately. So in other words, drawing an edge between CI and CJ means please separate CI from CJ. So the meaning of an edge here is very interesting. It means keep away. So that's what the relationship means, not keep them together, keep them away. So the meaning of an edge in a graph can be anything, right? And then we construct the under graph and explore a way of determining how many compartments are needed. We use graph, graph coloring to accomplish that. So let's start off by defining what do we mean by graph coloring? Well, if you have a graph, let's say vertex set V and edge set E, we say that a proper coloring, a proper coloring of the graph is a coloring or labeling of the vertices such that if you have this edge, let's say AB, where the vertices are A and B, and this undirected edge, then A and B are colored or labeled differently. In other words, if there's a color label for A, it has to be a different color label for B. And then what's referred to as the chromatic number of the graph, denoted by this Greek letter chi of G, what is the minimum number of colors it would take to properly cover a graph? It's a very famous problem, but it relates to this idea of optimization and sense of how many compartments do you need. It relates to finding this minimal number of colors to color the vertices. So it's a really, really interesting problem that's attracted people's interest for, for actually several centuries. So uh, let's move on to page 135, uh, give you some history before we go into a very simple example. So some history of graph coloring it was first studied in the 19th century by Francis Guthrie and Augustine de Morgan. If you're wondering, is that the de Morgan of de Morgan laws? Yes. Studied in 1852. Determining the smallest number that should be colors uh, needed to color a planar graph. That was the infamous four color problem we've talked about before. That was supposedly claimed to be answered by uh, Arthur Cayley in 1879. Sir Alfred Kemp provided a very formal proof for the four coloring theorem, but some errors were discovered by uh, Percy Hewood in this time, in, in the turn of the century from the 19th to the 20th century. And the proof stood for almost a decade until in 1976, Ken Appel, University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana, Urbana-Champaign, excuse me, uh, and Wolfgang Hocken confirmed that the chromatic number is in fact four for planar graphs by computer, and I had met him when I was a graduate student at Illinois. So let's look at an example. Um, one way sometimes to determine the chromatic number of graph is to look for subgraphs that we definitely know how to color. And for example, coloring a complete graph is very easy to understand, okay? Um, and what we'll look at, first of all, is suppose you have this original graph here indicated by these, these vertices here, Ignore the numbers just for a sec, and just focus on these uh, letters here, right? And our goal is to color this graph. In other words, to figure out how to uh, colorize each of the vertices so that no edge connects any vertices of the same color. Clearly, you see K3 subgraphs in here, and I've pulled out this top one here. So we have the ABG subgraph. It's not hard to show that the chromatic number right, of K3 has to be three. It takes three colors to color that, right? Because whatever color A is, B cannot be the same, but G can't be the same as A or B, so it needs a third color. <clears throat> so in fact, as indicated down here, the chromatic number of any KN is always in. So one way of thinking about how to color a graph is to find complete subgraphs within it, right? And so the fact that this subgraph requires three colors, that's the beginning of the num minimum number of colors you should consider. And then if you need more, you would have to grow. So we would start off by saying, well, let's color the subgraph here. One color there, two color there, third color there, and then see how far we can get with three colors. And it turns out you can show very quickly how to color the other vertices so that you don't have any two vertices connected of the same number here, which represents a color. So in fact, the chromatic number of this entire graph is three, the same as the chromatic number of K3, right? Turns out Peterson graph 
we can show again we know about um, looking at um, subgraphs as well it also has k3 subgraphs and or uh, or in terms of looking at k33 subgraphs we know k33 subgraph of those um, and we can show that the chromatic number of that graph is three as well so let's move on to page 136 and do a more complicated example and there's a little error that needs to be corrected in this table so here Suppose we want the chromatic number of this 10 vertex graph. Again, seeking subgraphs that we can find for which we know the chromatic number is key. And it turns out the one I wanted to focus in on is this one right here. If you pull that subgraph out, we have B, and we have F, and we have H. And then we have I, and if you look at it very carefully in terms of connecting all the vertices here, okay, and just draw some vertices there, and there's also an edge coming in here, the F. What you have here is K4, and that's the induced subgraph V from this vertex set is isomorphic the K4, it's a K4 subgraph. And we know that the chromatic number pi of K4 is equal to four. So that tells us minimally, at least four colors are gonna be needed to color this graph. And then we can see if we can finish out using four or we're gonna to have to add another one, right? So um, what I've done here is I've sort of illustrated a nice table of what the coloring can be and um, and so what we'll do is we'll just put some labels here for colors and see for a fact if uh, no two vertices of the same color are connected. And what I illustrated here in this table is that, for example, we could make this, uh, this vertex with letter B, make that red. So I'm just going to script in an R here for red. Uh, J could be red. Uh, a could be green. It's connected to that one, so it would have to be a different color. That would be green. Uh, D can't be red, but it could be green. And I could be green as well, and both, because it's connected to red, that vertex, which is red, see, so that's got to be green. We'll make it green. So we're working now with three, uh, two colors, then we're going to throw a white in. Um, now you need to correct your notes because there was a slight error. So we're going to make uh, we're going to make G white. It's connected to this vertex, so it can't be green. Uh, we're going to make E white. It can't be red for sure. It can't be right red or green, so it has to be white. We can see that, right? Can't be red or green. And then H sitting over here. Um, cannot be green for sure, so we're going to make it uh, white. Again, white is connected to green, white is connected to green, that's fine. But then now we have an issue with F. F can't be red, it can't be green, it can't be white, it's going to have to be blue, right? And then we come back up the same thing to look at C. C can't be red, it can't be green, it can't be white, but it can be blue. Right? And there we are four colors. And another reason we know there are four colors there is you can ask yourself, is this a planar graph? And the answer is yes, because none of those edges cross. Don't ignore my little subgraph in there. So it's a planar graph, so we know that chromatic number is four, the four color theorem. So, um, question is, is there a formal method to determine the chromatic number, right? And the answer is yes. And we're going to use a beautiful sort of algebraic structure to do that. And to do that, we're going to define what's called a chromatic polynomial. So let's assume that we have undirected graph and that you have lambda colors are available. So we're gonna use the variable lambda to indicate the number of colors at all times, all right? that you can use for vertices. So the chromatic polynomial, and this is how you write it, P, capital P for the polynomial, it's a function of the graph and the colors. Okay. 
So we have the graph itself and the colors. It's the chromatic polynomial of the graph. It indicates how many different ways G can be properly colored using lambda color. So it's kind of a combinatorical type of polynomial there. It tells you how many different ways you can color it with a certain number of colors. So a coloring can be thought of as a function that maps the vertices to your colors, where f of u and f of v cannot be equal. That's again proper coloring. You can't have f of u and f of v being connected for adjacent vertices, right? You can't have that for adjacent vertices. So a couple of examples. If you had a graph, and let's say you had n vertices, but you had no edges, edges. So if the edge set was the empty set, that means all you have are isolated vertices. There's no edges between them. And if you had to color, then quickly you would have to use, uh, so the question is, is how many colors could you choose for um, each vertex? You could choose lambda for each one of them, okay? Right. Again, because there are no edges, right? So there's no worry about edges uh, causing constraints of, of, you know, if I choose a color here, it can't be the same color. Well, there's no edges there. So that's kind of trivial, but in that case, the polynomial is lambda to the n. So you just use the product rule and multiply all those choices, okay? Because there are no constraints on each one of those vertices in terms of color. Okay? Now, if you have a connected graph, for example, by Kn, all right, then we can see, ah, things change now because the polynomial, the chronic polynomial will take on this form. You'll have lambda choices, say, for the first vertex, but then the next one, it can't be the same, and the next one can't be the same as the previous two. And so you can show that it's the product form here, and this product form, lambda times lambda minus one times lambda minus two, and you'll go all the way down to lambda minus n plus one, that's usually defined as this lambda superscript print in. That's sort of a notation used for this product form representation. Lambda to the, not quite the n power, to the print n power, which represents this product form, okay? Right, again, if you had K3, a fully connected triangular structure, you would have lambda choices for colors there, but you'd have one less choice here, and then here, you can't choose that color and that color, so you have less colors, right? So you have lambda times lambda minus one times lambda minus two possible colors. Okay? Now, if the number of colors is less than the chromatic number, then by default, the polynomial is zero. You don't have enough colors, because this is telling you the minimum number needed, and you don't even have that. So we'll define that polynomial as zero, okay? All right? So let's do some examples illustrating chromatic polynomials on page 137. Okay. Very simple illustrations here. Um, and pay attention to this, the form of these graphs. So this is, a, this is a graph where you can see it's kind of, you can fold it out and be very linear, even though it looks like a, a you know, sort of like a bucket here. You could fold A down and D down, it's very linear. So if you're looking at defining what the polynomial is, that's what we're looking for, the chromatic polynomial here, basically start with, in this case, this pendant index. Start with one end and say, well, you can choose, you've got lambda colors, so A could take on, you know, if it was three colors, we can make it red, we can make it green, or it could be blue. But once you choose the color for A, you realize you've got one less choice for B, correct? Because this is this is, has an edge from B to A, so you have one less choice here. Now, if you continue on to C, now you might have thought, well, what should shouldn't this be lambda minus two? Well, this is a linear connection here, right? So this color that you wouldn't let B have, this one could take back on. So again, you're only limited by whatever B is. So that's why it's lambda minus one. And the same thing holds for D. It's only dependent on a color of whatever vertex C is. So if you multiply those three cases out, you have lambda times what? Lambda minus one to the third power. 
And just to give you an illustration of, you know, if you had five colors, just to give you an idea of the choices, that should be equals. If you were, if you can, if you plugged in five into that function, you would get 320 ways you can color that graph if you had five colors. If you sort of, this is like a chain, right? If you made the chain a little bit longer, in other words, the next example, again, it's still linear in the sense that you have two pendant vertexes at the ends and then you just move all the way from one to the other. I think you see very quickly the pattern. Anytime you add another one, all you're going to do is add another power of lambda minus one. So this will be lambda minus one to the fourth power. Again, because as you move along the chain here, so to speak, your coloring is only dictated as a restriction of the previous one, right? Can't match up. So again, if you were to plug in five, adding that one vertex in, you go up now to 1,280 possible colorings for the, um, uh, should we, five vertex, sorry, that's an error, for the five vertex graph. So let's, um, before we move on, there's an upshot on, pay, on the next page on 183. So the upshot is, if your graph is divided by a path of the vertices, right, then the chromatic polynomial will have this form, lambda times lambda minus one to the n minus one power. So we've already determined that if you have that linear kind of path to it. If your graph has k components, and you can break those, you know, you have, sub, you have different subgraphs here, g1, g2, and gk. So there's k components that are disconnected from each other. Then the overall polynomial is just the product of all of the subpolynomials. You find the polynomials for all the subgraphs, and you multiply them all together. That seems kind of intuitive. That's just the product rule. From our common form stuff. Um, now we're going to talk about decomposing uh, chromatic polynomials um, uh, that can help us again determine the uh, the chromatic number. And to do that, we need a definition. And in this definition, we let, assuming G is an undirected connected graph. And let's suppose E is an edge, for example, below, defined by the vertices A and B, then directed. We're going to define a new subgraph called G sub E. It's related to this edge, where the subgraph is contained by deleting that edge from the original graph. So you completely remove that edge and the vertices that define that edge from the graph. Then there's another subgraph we call G sub E prime, is another graph that is obtained by coalescing, or another way of saying coalescing is merging the vertices A and B that you took out in G E, right? So here's an illustration below. So we have these four vertices, and we're interested in deleting this edge right here, right? So if we delete that edge, um, and I should have said earlier, you're not removing, I'm sorry, without removing the vertices A and B. Very careful. Okay. So what we're doing is taking this edge out and leaving the vertices in. That's what we call G sub E. Okay. It's just a notation representing that subgraph. Take that edge out, leave the vertices in. G prime of E is the subgraph where you're merging. In other words, we're basically saying that this vertex is the same as this vertex. And if that's the case, you could think about like folding up and putting this vertex on top of each other. And then all you have is that big, you have this vertex connected to D and this vertex connected to C. So you're kind of flipping it over. If you kind of look at it that way, you can see this is what G prime sub E is, right? So this is, a, this is coalescing and this is deleting. So 
The reason we want to look at that is because of a very nice theorem called the decomposition of the chromatic polynomial, that you can get a relation between the original chromatic polynomial of your graph with these modified forms. And here's what the theorem states. Again, you have a connected graph, and the theorem states is for a given connected graph with this particular edge E out of your edge set, the chromatic polynomial of G sub E, the graph that you get from deleting that edge, is always the sum of the polynomial of the original graph plus the polynomial of this merged graph. Okay. Right? Really nice theorem because you can see you could use it, for example, to get the polynomial of the original graph is just the difference between the G sub E lambda polynomial minus the merged or coalesced graph. So that, again, just using a little algebra there. Okay. And so we're gonna do that with the example below, all right? And so the example below, again, if our goal was to determine the, um, the uh, chromatic polynomial of the, this is not a complete graph. If it was complete, we know what the answer is, right? You got four vertices. If it was complete, and that was a K4 subgraph, we automatically know the chromatic number is four, right? And we could, therefore, um, we could, uh, we would know exactly how many, we, you know, we wouldn't need the bar on, but we'd know exactly how many colors that we need to, to, uh, to, uh, to use to color the graph. Um, but we could go back and say from, um, oh, I'm sorry, from example two on page 136, we already know that if it was a connected graph, in other words, we know for Kn, the polynomial is of this form lambda to the super n, which is lambda times lambda minus one times lambda minus two, et cetera, All right? That's what I mean. So here we are. So what we're doing here is I'm actually using this revision of the decomposition theorem here that says what I want to use is that the chromatic polynomial of this graph is the polynomial of G sub E lambda, where you have deleted edge, minus the polynomial of the coalesced version. Okay? So this is the representation of the polynomials for each of those. This is what I want to find. So by deleting this edge, notice I get a nice linear form, and it's very easy for me to determine what that, we already know what the chromatic polynomial looks like, right? We just did this one earlier with four vertices. That's lambda times lambda minus one cubed. Then by merging, in other words, if we merge um, the merger of, of, of the vertices associated with that edge means we have to merge B and D. So this becomes the same as D. D is connected to C, so therefore this merge then connects to C. B was connected to A, so you keep the edges in play, right? And we just merge the vertices, but that's a K3 graph, right? And we already know that that has this polynomial form, the chromatic polynomial is that form. So if we just rewrite this, that just says the chromatic polynomial of this original graph is that term minus the following, lambda times lambda minus one times lambda minus two. So all you have to do is whatever that number is, start factoring lambda, lambda minus one, lambda two, make sure you have three factors. Okay? If this was a four, you would have the fourth factor, lambda minus three. Then we could easily clean all this up, do a little algebra there, and show this is lambda the fourth, minus four lambda cubed, plus six lambda squared, minus three lambda. Notice there won't be any constant term there. And then having this polynomial using the decomposition theorem, then you would just plug in, if you wanted a chromatic number, you would just start plugging in. I mean, that is the goal is to get the chromatic number. So you plug in different values. If you plugged in one color, you would see if you plugged in one, um, you would get one minus four plus six minus three and you get zero, right? If you plugged in two, 
you would get two, right? Which is definitely greater than zero. So that's what we want. What's the first non-zero value you get when you start plugging in colors? In this case, the chromatic number of the graph is two. Now, you may have seen that originally, so that, again, that means we could color this red and green and red and green. That's, but I want you to understand how you can use this decomposition. But we did a simple example, but for a very complex graph, this can be very, very useful by finding a way of breaking edges to produce subgraphs with chains and then coalesce to get an easy form for these polynomials. So I'm going to stop here on page 138 and pick up with example seven, it's a little more complicated example, um, and sort of show you the algebra of doing chromatic polynomials in the next lecture.